Before we get started, I want to dedicate this episode to my good friend Travis Sharp and all the team over at Unsheltered International. Travis and his family have spent years reaching out to the homeless in cities all over the United States. Just recently, he's expanded his ministry and has traveled over to minister among the poverty-stricken in the Philippines. Now, I know there are a lot of ministries that specialize in reaching out to the homeless, but Travis and his team at Unsheltered have a special place in my heart. This Thanksgiving, please consider giving a donation to this ministry that is having an impact on so many lives to the glory of God. Just go to unsheltered.org and click on the donate button at the top of the page. Thanks for giving. In the close confines of an urban jungle, they're not too hard to find. Some of them are more forward than others, not really caring if you see them or not. But most try to stay hidden. People hurriedly making their way down the city streets pretend like they're not there. They treat them like some family ghost that if they ignore long enough will just simply go away. But these people are no ghosts. They may be people who are haunted by the incessant and gnawing bite of addiction, but they're not ghosts. They may be people trapped in the nightmare of mental or emotional abnormality, but they're not apparitions. They may be people who through a series of life-altering catastrophes have seen their world come crumbling down around them, but they're not phantoms. No, they're very much flesh and bone. Those yellow bloodshot eyes are not that much different from yours. In the right conditions of summer's heat or winter's chill, the skin that covers your hand would look just as dry and leathery as theirs. Jerry was one of those back alley, homeless and nameless people that shop owners and townsfolk wish would vanish into thin air. He was a misfit, a thief, and an all around menace to society. One might think that seven years in a state penitentiary and a good dose of jailhouse religion would have gone a long way in changing Jerry. But it didn't. Once a free man, he hit the streets again, this time plunging deeper and deeper into wickedness, thinking that somehow he had outstretched the bounds of the love of God. But at the last, God was there with an extended hand of love each time he fell. Until one day, it was he that God was using to extend His hand of love and compassion to others. A helping hand that reached out to thousands languishing on the streets of New York City with a hot meal, a clean bed, and the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. And it was He who sparked a movement that for the last 140 years has impacted the lives of millions of people. I'm Ronnie Brown. And this is Forgotten. Jerry McCauley was born in Ireland in 1839. From the moment of his birth, it seemed like the deck was stacked against him. His family disintegrated not long after he entered this world. His father was a criminal, a counterfeiter by trade, and forsook his family to run from the law. Not much is known about his mother. Either she could not or would not care for this child and gave him over to his grandmother. This woman was little more than a guardian on paper. Young Jerry was never sent to school, never taught to read, He was allowed to basically just come and go as he pleased, which led to constant run-ins with the authorities. On top of this, no matter into whose hands he was entrusted, he suffered abuse and harsh treatment. Finally, at age 13, in exasperation, Jerry's grandmother sent him to the United States to live with his sister in New York City. 
Although he started out with legitimate work for his brother-in-law, he quickly began to stoop down into a life of dishonesty and theft. Before long, he was out of his sister's home and living by his wits on the street. He would work for what he could and then steal the rest. After a while, he came into the possession of a boat that he would use to steal cargo from docked ships in the New York Harbor under the cloak of darkness. He and a few cohorts would wade into the waters by night, stealing all that they could, and then by day sell the goods and then paint the town red. He became a notorious nuisance to the Fourth Ward in Lower Manhattan. Although what Jerry McCauley had in fact done as a river thief was enough to send him to prison a hundred times over, the charges that caught up with him were, by his own account, completely not his doing. He was charged with highway robbery. Local merchants and store owners saw a chance to rid themselves of the young man, so they pointed the finger at Jerry for a recent robbery. Without much of a legal defense, McCauley was sentenced to 15 years hard labor in the state prison known as Sing Sing. Although untaught, he had picked up some sounds and letters along the way, enough to be able to read the haunting words above the entrance to the prison. The way of the transgressor is hard, Proverbs 13, 15. This was a phrase that was often repeated and familiar to those of a life of sin and lawlessness, even though it was a verse from the Bible. To Jerry, the path his life had taken him was hard. He wanted to die. Fifteen years in the infamous Sing Sing prison for a crime he didn't commit? Sure, he had done a lot that merited a stiff penalty, but to know that he was in prison doing time for someone who walked away scot-free. The thought of someone happily walking at liberty while he suffered their wrong threw him into a rage and then sank him in depression. At length, he thought it best not to fight against the prison environment, but to attempt to follow its rules in hopes that by some means his sentence would be cut short. But this was not an easy thing to do in the 19th century Sing Sing. They held a strict silence system. Prisoners ate in silence. They worked in silence. They existed in a world of unbroken hush. When that silence was broken, there was harsh consequences. There were water tortures where water was allowed to drip onto an inmate's head from a high distance for hours at a time. Other punishments included solitary confinement, flogging with whips, and bucking, which was hanging a man upside down for long periods of time. Each time Jerry slipped up, each time he was punished, it only made him harder and harder. After five years at Sing Sing, Jerry was miserable. He had poured himself into learning to read and write with some measure of success. But what he fed his mind upon only fueled a murderous hatred for the ones who landed him in jail. One Sunday, he chose to go with the majority of the men to the chapel service rather than languish with despair in his cell. As he entered the room, his eyes fixed upon a familiar face on the platform. In his former days running the streets, Jerry did some prize fighting. Orville Gardner was a fighter, gambler, and all-around thug. Known as Awful Gardner, he was a brutal boxer, touted as one of the best fighting men in New York. He was favored to beat Dominic Bradley for the heavyweight championship of America. But after serving a stint in Sing Sing himself, Gardner was converted in the 1857 New York City Revival. One might see him as America's first celebrity convert to Christianity. He became a powerful preacher. When Jerry McCauley saw him that day, he remembered him as a calloused criminal. You can imagine the shock that came upon Jerry when Gardner began to speak. Gardner said he was uncomfortable standing behind the pulpit, thinking himself unworthy to speak from that place. He came down to the floor level among the men and there gave a tear-filled testimony of how he had been where they were sitting only a few years ago. He told them of the life-changing power of Jesus Christ and how God had worked in his life. It wasn't long before he knelt down, and through his sobs, he asked God to do a work in the hearts of the men in that room. There was not a dry eye in the place. Jerry was doing everything that he could to hold back the tears for fear of what others might think. Jerry knew Orville. He knew that God had worked a genuine miracle in this man's life. During his plea, Gardner mentioned a verse from the Bible which had a deep impact upon Macaulay's heart. 
He never knew that the old book that he thought was only for priests and saints could speak so powerfully, revealing his own heart. He determined to find this verse that Gardner had quoted. He returned to his cell, and he took out the Bible that was given him when he entered into prison. He dusted it off and opened it up. Where do I go to find the verse, he said. He thought he must start at the beginning and read it through. Although the verse that ignited his search was soon forgotten, another fire began to burn in his heart. He could not put the Bible down. Every day he poured over its pages, drinking in its truth. As soon as his work shift was complete, he hurried to his cell and read until the wee hours of the morning. One night, while turning all of this over in his mind and the change that had been made in the life of Gardner, he had a burning desire to have that same transformation. What should he do? Something seemed to tell him that he ought to pray. But what should he pray? His mind was drawn to the prayer of the publican, God be merciful to me, a sinner. He knew that he should call upon God, but he was ashamed to kneel down before God. He would fall upon his knees, but then immediately, out of embarrassment, he would stand up again. The word whosoever rang in his ears, that's me, he would say, but I'm so wicked, everything but a murderer, and that many a time in my will. But with every objection, the words of Scripture he had read came to the surface of his mind. This conflict went on for weeks. He would try to pray, and then he would rise, unable to call on God, wondering if by his wavering heart he would exhaust the long-suffering of God. Finally, one night, he resolved to stay on his knees until forgiveness of sin was found. On those cold stones, with clasped hands, He would pray, and then he would stop, and then he would pray again, and then stop. He became desperate, assuring himself that if he did not find relief this night, he would never pray again. As he persisted in seeking God, something happened. Macaulay, in his own words, said of the experience, quote, All at once, it seemed as if something supernatural was in my room. I was afraid to open my eyes. I was in agony, and the sweat rolled off my face in great drops. Oh, how I longed for God's mercy. Just then, in the height of my distress, it seemed as if a hand was laid upon my head, and these words came to me. My son, thy sins, which are many, are forgiven. I do not know if I heard a voice, Yet the words were distinctly spoken. Oh, the precious Christ, how plainly I saw him lifted on the cross for my sins. What a thrill went through me. I jumped from my knees. I paced up and down my cell. A heavenly light seemed to fill it, a softness and a perfume like the fragrance of sweet flowers. I did not know if I was living or not. I clapped my hands and shouted, praise God, praise God, end quote. The transformation that he had first witnessed in the heart of Orville Gardner had come to visit his own heart. He was a changed man. The heavy weight of vengeance and resentment for his being sent to prison had evaporated like the dew in the noonday summer sun. The prison walls became a sanctuary and his labor became a delight. The ridicule and sneers of other inmates that used to be a constant fear were nothing now compared to the delight of knowing and walking with Jesus. His heart erupted with love and thanksgiving to God for what he had done in his life. He became witness to all the other men that he had the chance to encounter. God began to do a great work from cell to cell through Jerry McCauley, and many began to read their Bible and to call upon God and to worship Jesus Christ in the days to follow. For the next two years, Jerry grew in the Lord and encouraged other men in their walk with Jesus. He lived a simple life of faith. There was nothing that he would encounter that he could not overcome by the power of Christ in his life. After a while, although with some hesitation, he began to pray to God that he would be set free from prison. And sure enough, it wasn't long that he received a pardon from the governor And after having served only half of his sentence, he was released from prison.
Upon his release, he purposed to stay clear of old acquaintances from the Fourth Ward and to find a prayer meeting. He did find one, and while pacing outside, decided not to go into the place. He had never been to a house of worship on the outside, and no one had invited him in to join them. He left in frustration. Soon out of necessity, he inquired of an old friend where he might find a place to stay. His friend directed him to a room above a saloon. His friend soon entreated him to join him in a harmless new drink that had become popular while Jerry was in prison. He said it was harmless, as harmless as root beer. It was something called lager beer. Jerry reluctantly agreed. And with one glass, an old appetite was awakened within him. And it wasn't long before he was drinking it every day. Thus began a spiral away from God and the commitments that he had made upon his exit from prison. He went from small job to small job, each one being a little shadier than the last. Eventually, he began working back on the river, buying and selling stolen and smuggled goods, trading in counterfeit money, and even thieving among the riverboats at night. This was not all done without one objection of conscience. He could not escape the memory of what he experienced in prison, the thrill of sins forgiven, the joy of winning others to Jesus, the peace of living in the will of God. This was all brought into sharp focus one night while on the river. He and a few others were out looking for what they could steal, and they latched onto a ferry boat to pull them back across the river to New York. Mid-river, an alarm sounded. The ferry was on fire, and it was spreading quickly. He and his friends tried to separate themselves from the boat, but two men leaped from the ferry to get onto the small boat. Jerry and his partner quickly rowed the men to shore and then set back out, not to save others, but to see what they could steal from the distressed vessel. Upon arriving back at the burning ferry, several more desperate passengers saw them and leaped toward them for safety. Grudgingly, the men took as many as possible onto the boat while others clung to its sides. The whole scene, with the fire and the screams and the desperation, called to Jerry's mind the vivid scenes of hell from the Bible and the final destiny of sinners. On another occasion, while trying to steal from a boat on the river, the captain was awakened by their attempt and fired a revolver at them as many as four times. Jerry could hear the daggers of hot lead whizzing past his head. Although he and his partner escaped unharmed, the thought of one of these bullets splitting his skull caused him to think over and over, what if that bullet had hit me? What would become of me? Where would I be? Jerry knew that the path that he was on was wrong. And yet he could not stop. His only cure from the nagging reminders of God was to drown each of them in whiskey. One night, Jerry and his partner were on the river near Brooklyn looking for what they could steal. Jerry was so intoxicated that when they did find something they could plunder, he was of no use and was left in the boat to sleep it off. By some mishap, Jerry fell into the water. He was helpless to save himself. As he tried, the boat simply floated away. The waters weighed him down until he finally sunk beneath him. He touched the bottom of the shallow riverbed and pushed himself back up. Then it all happened again. Finally, he knew that this was the last time. It seemed as though hell opened up beneath him. Then the thought came to him, call on God. He recalled at the thought at first. After all that he had done, how could he call on God? But the fear of death overpowered his reluctance, and he cried out to God for help. Miraculously, the boat that drifted away from him suddenly drew within his grasp. He somehow was able to climb back onto the boat while heaving for breaths. A clear impression was made in his heart. This was the last time. Jerry tried to drink and to drink and to make the impression go away. But the convicting power of God would not release his mind. Jerry tried to find some means of legitimate employment, but could not hold down a job because of his addiction to the bottle. One day, while sitting in a room, no doubt from which he would be evicted in coming days, 
he heard a man ask someone nearby, do you love Jesus? These words arrested his attention because they sounded so much like the words he used back in Sing Sing so long ago. He listened for and watched the man until he finally got up the courage to talk to him. The young man was a missionary from the Howard Mission Station in New Bowery. It was a place that they did all that they could to help the down and outers on the street. When Jerry arrived, they asked him to sign a pledge not to drink, not to be involved in crime. In return, they would attempt to find him employment. Jerry signed the agreement, figuring that he had nothing to lose, but he also warned the men that he would probably not be able to keep it. The men's response was only for him to try. Hours later, back with his riverboat partner, he took a glass of whiskey in his hand, pledging that this would be the very last. His friend joked, yeah, until the next. Suddenly, the missionary walked into the room. Macaulay, surprised by his appearance, did all that he could to avoid him. The missionary invited Jerry on a walk. During the walk, Jerry confided to the missionary that he was going to go out on the river that night to steal what he could. He had no choice. He was dead broke and he had to eat. The missionary looked at Jerry and said, Before you do that, I'll take the coat off my back and pawn it and give you the money. Jerry saw that the coat was old and tattered. Truth be known, this man did not have much more money than he did. Jerry hung his head in shame as tears trickled down his cheeks. The missionary asked Jerry to live by the words of Jesus. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jerry said he would. He would trust God. The missionary went away and in a few hours later came back with 50 cents. It was enough to get something to eat and prevent him from going out to steal that night. That missionary was a true friend to Jerry. And before long, God was once again dealing with this prodigal's heart. One night, the missionary invited Jerry into his home. After the meal that evening... The family was singing and Jerry began to be broken, weeping at all that had happened in his life. He asked the missionary to pray for him. In response, the missionary encouraged him to call out to God himself. Jerry said, I don't know how. I can't put the words together. Pray to God the prayer of the publican. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Jerry began to pray these familiar words over and over again. Then the missionary said, Put in the words, for Jesus' sake. There was something about that moment that was breaking for Jerry McCauley. He was given a true assurance of the saving power of Jesus. As he prayed, joy once again filled his heart and life. A joy that had been exiled from his soul for years. Oh, the mercy and grace of God that would not give up on such a hardened wretch and wayward son. This missionary friend would see Jerry through a few more times of faltering, nowhere near the extent of what he went through after leaving Sing Sing. This was because he had a Christian brother to help him up, to pray for him, and to keep him accountable. Jerry was able to find steady work for a time, and when work ran out, he was strong enough in the Lord to go into his closet and ask God to meet his need instead of wading into the river to steal what he needed. During one day at work, he had somewhat of a vision. He described it in these words, quote, I was singing at my work, and my mind became absorbed, and it seemed as if I was working for the Lord down at the fourth ward. I had a house, and people were coming in. There was a bath, and as they came in, I washed and cleansed them outside, and the Lord cleansed them inside. They came at first by small numbers, then by hundreds, and afterwards by thousands, end quote. From somewhere within his heart, he was asked, quote, Would you do that for the Lord if he should call you? Would you do it for Jesus' sake, end quote? Jerry's answer was, quote, Yes, Lord, open the way, and I will go, end quote. This vision burned in his heart, and he begged God for the opportunity to share it with others. On two different occasions, 
God did open the door to share the vision with Christians gathered at special meetings. Several sums of money were donated to the project. Altogether, he was given $450 toward the work. There was a house down on Water Street in the Fourth Ward that was in the possession of the City Mission and Track Society. They recommended that 316 Water Street be placed at Jerry McCauley's disposal for this work. In October of 1872, he took the $450 and applied it to the cleaning and repairing of the building. A sign was placed out front, Helping Hand for Men. The Helping Hand building was renovated and prepared to be a beacon of hope for the hopeless and aimless men of the Fourth Ward. The repair was completed in November of that year, and on Thanksgiving Day in 1872, the first meal was offered to the needy there at the Helping Hand for Men on 316 Water Street. A table was spread, and a number of needy and outcasts were not only to enjoy a hearty meal, but they were in attendance at a worship service. A worship service where God mightily poured out His Spirit and moved upon the hearts of all present. There was such a sense of the wonderful presence of God that they decided to do the same thing again the next night, and then the next night, and then the following night. Jerry served at the helping hand for the next 10 years. Scores of men were saved by the grace of God in that time. When he left in 1882, it was to start the Craymore Mission near Times Square as a, quote, beachhead in a vast jungle of vice and debauchery, end quote, near 6th Avenue. He labored there for two years before he passed away on a September afternoon in 1884. He died of tuberculosis, which he had contracted while in Sing Sing prison years ago. Renowned poet and songwriter Fanny Crosby, who was a regular at the mission, singing and serving, was inspired by the life of Jerry McCauley to write a prayer which was later turned into a song. Lord, behold in thy compassion those who kneel before thee now. They are in a sad condition. None can help them, Lord, but thou. They are lost, but do not leave them in their dreary path to Rome. There is pardon, precious pardon, if to thee by faith they come. The vision that God gave Jerry McCauley was not only realized in his lifetime, but can be found all across the length and breadth of this nation. In the maze of city streets, where so many are lost in ruin and addiction, chances are, just a few blocks away, there's a Christian ministry who has a vision for taking in the homeless, offering them a place to be bathed and cleansed on the outside in hopes that Jesus would clean the inside. So many that occupy the park benches and sidewalks of our cities are not much different than Jerry, someone that has fallen again and again and again. So many times that those nearby may be tempted to just give up on them. But God never grows weary of the clay and throws it away. His persistent love continues to reach out a helping hand to those that are broken. Believers are left with this responsibility. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Forgotten is written and produced by me, Ronnie Brown. You can find out more about this show at ForgottenPodcast.com. And as always, thanks for listening.